I said, empty your mind. Be formless, shapeless, like water. It's about how hard you hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. How much you can take and keep moving forward. Join movement expert Aaron Alexander as he dives into the minds of the foremost innovative healthcare thinkers and movement masters on their approach to optimal health and wellness. A Lion Podcast. Welcome back to Lion Podcast. My name is Aaron Alexander. In today's beautiful episode, I had one of my preferred humans in the world, Mr. Kaj Larson. Um, Kaj has a super robust resume ranging from uh, at one point he was journalist for Vice News that's he might still be doing things with them actually um, he's been a correspondent for CNN he's been featured all over the place ranging from Huffington Post to ABC to NBC to just all over the place um, so beyond being a journalist he's got dang Navy SEAL um, and in this conversation we get into his stories of um, experiences in battle experiences in Hell Week experience doing um, journalism on on a uh, a vast array of super interesting topics. So, hope you guys enjoy this conversation. Thanks so much for jumping onto the website, alignpodcast.com, A L I G N podcast.com. On there, you can start the five day movement challenge. Super simple, five videos breaking down fundamental movements that I think everybody has got to have in their day to day. And uh, you can jump on there, alignpodcast.com. Thanks so much to Cured Nutrition for supporting this podcast. I really dig those guys. They infuse CBD into all sorts of delicious herbs and spices and like uh, this delicious peanut butter bar thing that I find just incredible. Um, and they're great. They also have the, the standard oils and all that super high quality stuff. Uh, it's affordable. You can get yourself 10% off by going to Cured Nutrition. Dot com use align code for 10% off um, I think we're good to go thanks for using iTunes thanks for doing you um, I'm around some wind chimes I wonder if you hear those guys you probably do hope it's soothing and not annoying um, that's it here we go back to the podcast uh, the beginning of this conversation was kind of like warming each other up you could say that sounds kind of sexual it's not how I mean it um, but it's kind of like bantery and then in about 10 minutes in we get into some getting some good stuff all right here we go. Align podcast. Somebody's on your book doc. Oh, yeah. This is a common occurrence for you. I, I, I mean, <laughs> look, I, not to interrupt like you, you about to get to a strong point. D- definitely, I wasn't. But look, you drive the train, but I will provide some information that this will happen about twenty times over the course of our podcast. All right, so so I like, we can get excited about it for sure. Time. I get excited every time. All right, uh, you build a goddamn book doc. A, a floating book exchange. Floating book exchange. Yeah. I had a lot of <laughs> debates within the family about what to call it because I really, you know, you got to be, you got to be, even if you're using an old school medium like this ancient bound thing with paper and black marks on it. That, it's old school. Yeah, yeah, yeah that the, uh, that the, uh, the elder generation refers to as books. Even if you're building something that's an homage to books, um, you have to kind of be sort of modern and sophisticated about it. So for people who are not sitting in my living room with us, I live on these two canals and I, I built this floating book exchange for the, for the canals community and people come and they give books and they take books and they read on the little bench. And it's, uh, but within my family, we had a big debate about, you know, how do we label this thing? Venice floating dock book exchange hashtag started to get pretty wordy yeah. at some point. There was no efficient way to describe this thing in our collective social media world. Right. So You got to the bottom of it. Sort of. Hashtag like, Venice Book Exchange. You're nailing it. it. It's still like pretty verbose, but you know, it's about books, so maybe it's good to be wordy. Yeah. 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 I, I like it. Before we were talking about the, uh, I feel like my, my audio is a little funny. Let me see here. I'm going to crank my shit up. Boom. Now I'm in there. Before we were talking about the just the value of just taking action Mm. and just making the damn book exchange like i i wonder that with walking past things all the time this is redundant because i was just saying this to you but you know we see things and we just expect that they just happen or we like we wait for somebody else to do the thing it's a cool little metaphor a little like well for me like a little life lesson just like build the book exchange like make make stuff cool well i think also in in our modern age where like there's lots of things in our in our current environment that are dysfunctional i would extend that statement to to government and everything else so it's incumbent upon those of us with a sense of community or a sense of values to like you said 
take action, yeah. just do something. And at the end of the day, I think you and I both have this shared ethos of self-reliance, right? Um, other people aren't going to do it. Like, so sometimes you just got to do it and actually build something and use your hands. Another lost esoteric art of actually building something with your hands. Yeah. I was reading a thing, I'm reading this book called play right now and I'm um, doing a, a chapter about play. And so I'm all enamored by it. One of the things in there was the value of uh, children using their hands, crafting and doing stuff with their hands that ends up being huge for their capacity for problem solving as adults. So it's like, they're literally like neurologically integrating there, but like we do all this passive play, you know, stuff that we, we think of as being no big deal, but it's actually doing this deep work. You know, sometimes just those little things end up having large consequence. Yeah. And, and, and another shared value of ours is just this kind of mind body awareness, right? Yep. Like I think we all have this, this healthy fear of, of being over digitized or that the next, the follow on generations are going to be so over digitized that they're going to lose some of these sort of skill sets and neurological connections, um, that we developed by being so analog. Uh, you and I are probably the last kind of generations that like were reared in an, a pre-digital world, right? Yeah. In an analog world, like I mean, we know what a number two pencil is, yeah. right? And that's just not true. Uh, forever. I think it's, I think there's going to be a a stark contrast between like, I think it's going to be like the beatniks, which are the people like that still walk. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> you know, it's opposed to getting like the non-burners, the yeah. non-burners, <laughs> <Right>. yeah. <laughs> you know, or people that just like like yeah, people that still just use their bodies. I think that we, it seems like we're going towards a direction of outsourcing all of that. And I have a feeling with the whole singularity and you know, bionic whatever. There's, it, it seems to me maybe it's already happened, but there's going to be like a distinct kind of why in the road of sorts. Yeah, a, a real cleavage. And while there are parts of me that want to make sure to raise alarm bells about that, like I also want to be open-minded to not being resistant to change and, you know, being too overly nostalgic about the way things were. I think this is like a classic m- mistake in, right. you know, um, revisionist thinking. And, and I remember reading, I think it was part of a book once um, that... And I think it was part of a book that was kind of argue like both warning against the dangers of 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 digitization in our lives, um, but also at the same time like posted a conceit. Imagine if video games were built um, before books, right? And that like let's say video games were invented, you know. Five hundred. I, I forget when the Gutenberg printing press came about. A thousand years ago, five hundred years ago, something. Imagine that. Yeah, it was fourteen eighty three. No big deal. Very. I'm just, I'm just joking. Yes. No idea. Oh, I was so impressed. <laughs> <laughs> if this wasn't like, if this would just float away into nothingness, like a conversation, <laughs> I would have stuck with that. Yeah, yeah. But you can track, you can Fake it check the record, it. so I can't do that. I feel like if I thought hard about enough about it, I'm going to guess 16 in the 1600s. <laughs> all right. But yeah. For Me- Gutenberg. Yeah. But. Message in. This isn't a live right. podcast, but. <laughs> <laughs> um, so imagine like they invented PlayStation instead of the printing press at, at that moment, however many hundreds of years ago it was. And kids grew up with this like networked idea where they were playing video games against each other and it was highly dynamic and they were communicating via the internet and they had multiplayer team games and all of this stuff. And then, you know, fast forward 500 years later, books were invented and parents would be like, worried sick about their children They're, they would have support groups like oh my poor child they like do this weird thing where they like sit by themselves in a corner and they don't talk to any other children and all of that stuff and it's kind of like an interesting conceit right now yeah. I believe me I built a book exchange I believe in the value of reading and stuff but it means that I don't want to like totally dismiss the sort of cerebral power of new technologies and stuff like that. I just, like point. everything else, I want to be balanced about it. It seems like books, they have almost like this back end hidden value of teaching you to, to be okay with being with yourself, mm. you know? Yeah, as this um, sort of like non-explicit benefit. Yeah. Totally, totally. And I think like 
to defend literature for a second and to defend reading yeah. is you almost had me like off the boat. No, yeah. I, 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 was, I was like, shit, you're right. Yeah. Books are terrible. They're terrible. <laughs> what are we thinking? Uh, yeah. I would never punish my kid with this book thing. Right. Uh, no, but like, he, here's what I think books do do is I think they help you think in a very deep and focused way. Um, if you think about the ancient Greeks, they used to be able to memorize two and three hours of text at a time. So think about the richness and complexity of your ideas and your thought when you can recite two or three hours of text, right? And it's, uh, there's this great book, I think it's called In the Shallows by a, a, a guy named Hal something, and he talks about the cognitive effects of digital technology on your brain, the, mm. the, the neuroscience behind it. And, and one of the things that he says is that he, he makes the analog that reading uh, is, is a lot like REM cycle sleep, mm. right? Um, so if you think about deep sleep, I think there's seven layers of REM cycle and you have to, you have to go through each cycle in order to get to that REM rapid eye movement where you're dreaming and the most deepest level of rest and sleep, right? And what happens if you, if you fall asleep and you're at level one and level two and level three, and then your phone rings and wakes you up, you don't pick back right back up at level three. You start back at one and have to work all the way through the order mm. to get the deepest level of, of sleep. And he says that that's a good parallel um, for focus and attention as well, that there's multiple layers of focus and attention, and you have to work through each one in order to get to that seventh level equivalent of focus and attention. Mm. And that seventh level is where a lot of deep creative well. thinking happens, right? And so we all read on our computers or our iPhones. Imagine you're reading and your your mind is starting to synthesize these really deep creative connections and you're at level two and level three. And then boom, like your text message pops up and you yeah. click over and text it or you get an Instagram notification, right? You boom, you're all, you're popped out of that ladder um, in order to get to the deepest level. And what ends up happening is you can never really get to like that truly deep creative focused level of thought. And he says like when you peel away from something to check your email or check your text message, uh, there's a, he calls it like a switching cost, a neurological switching cost between switching back and forth from this great article that you're reading that's stimulating your thinking to some stupid email you have to respond to, right? And then there's a switching cost of going back, a neurological switching cost. And I think I certainly have had this experience. I think most people have. Um, it, Instagram is like perfectly designed for that kind of dopamine hit. You just oh, yeah. next, next, next. And so it creates then, hence the title of the book, In the Shallows, this level of thinking. He describes it as that you're skimming the ocean of knowledge with a thimble, mm. right? Just across the surface, but you never really go deep. Mm. Have you done Vipassana? No. It, I can't tell if that is a, a South American It's a dish. dish. Yeah, you... it's a dish. It's okay. delicious. No, okay. it's not. No, it's, yeah, not. Yeah. it's a 10-day meditation, silent meditation thing. Wow. Uh, so Vipassana, you can do like Vipassana style meditation, which is its own style of meditation. Um, but traditionally, Vipassanas will be, you know, it's, it, the starting point at least is 10 days. They also do like 20-day and I think 30-day and different varieties of it. But that's something that I found it, with that experience was I didn't get to... Could, what was like conceivably what felt to be like real value until like day eight. Wow. <laughs> wow. So it was like torture, 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 and then enlightenment of some sort. I wouldn't go that far, but, and then, then, so, so this guy, SN Gwenka is the guy that he kind of, he didn't find, found Vipassana. He, he bases it off of Siddhartha, like Buddha. Sure. Um, but he founded, he, he popularized it and brought it to the West and has this foundation and all that. Um, but he, towards the end there, there's these discourses and towards the end there, he talks about it being deep, uh, emotional psychological surgery, which is really fascinating. And so it's like, you're almost like preparing, like when you go into surgery, you put on the, the gown and they clean you and they do the whole thing and they, you know, you sign the insurance, but there's all this bullshit. Right. And then I felt like, okay, cool. The scalpel's going in. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's kind of like, I don't think that that's an analogy he really uses, but that's what he calls it. And it's like, okay, like day eight, day nine, we're like deep, deep psychological surgery is how he talks. Wow. It's pretty cool. Wow. But it um, takes that, that, that time, that cushion. Yeah. I, I look, I don't, 
I don't want to say if I couldn't do it. I feel like <laughs> I could do anything. I I feel like I you recognize those first six or seven days would also be torturous for yeah. me. Yeah. yeah. For a lot of people, it's like, so a lot of people quit on day two and then day six or seven, I think, oddly enough. There's like, no, day six. And if you make it past day six, it's like you're going to stick around. But day two, after and, after and, day one, people are like, screw this and then after day six i think it starts to potentially start to kind of unfurl some layers you know that's a little bit like oh wow i'm like starting to feel funny and then people will duck out then oftentimes right. but there's like much sort longer of right ones. on the precipice of the some kind of breakthrough the, the, yeah right the yeah there's a quote from Rumi uh call call he says something along like the, the cure for the pain is in the pain you know so if you can sit with yourself you know or feel into like oh i have this uncomfortable like we have so many mediums to divert ourselves away from ourselves and you jump into the notifications like boom back at it you're back into that yeah. you know what you're talking about yeah it's yeah. interesting i read a lot of Rumi when i was in afghanistan yeah obviously, i just know that i just reasons. know know that yeah. quote That's yeah. what <laughs> <laughs> That Ruby quoted the Gutenberg printing press. <laughs> That's fourteen eighty three. Bring, bring those party tricks out, <laughs> dude. So, what's your story, man? You're a pretty fascinating layer, layer dude. You got a lot of interesting things going on. Yeah, I, I, I like to say I don't know if this is uh, an excuse for not being totally focused um, or not being unidimensional, but like I, I like to say, I like to pursue the lost art of being a Renaissance man. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. It seems like you're actually doing that as opposed to like people that's, I was looking at somebody's Instagram thing recently and they said spiritual leader yeah. in the thing. And I'm just like, oh. <sighs> so one thing, I don't know if it's good or bad about me, but it, it just is, it just exists in the world, you know, yeah. um, is that, you know, I grew up in Santa Cruz, right? Yeah. A real like hub of alternative thinking and, and counterculture, um, activity and you know I have friends right now up at at Esalen which is this amazing you know retreat in Big Sur which is forever like you know sparked a lot of genesis of like vanguard thinking and stuff so I and my parents I won't say hippies because I once called my mom a hippie on national TV and she wig out oh my god she went crazy <laughs> We had such a big fight. Like, we talk a lot. Like, we're very close. And, like, she literally didn't talk to me for, like, two weeks. And wow. then eventually, like, ended up, like, when we had our breakthrough, you know, we had our silent meditation of two weeks. Good. And then our breakthrough moment was where she goes, uh, I was like, Mom, like, you don't understand. Like, I was using it as shorthand. She doesn't like that hippie, hippies have been castigated in, in yeah. the media and in pop culture and stuff. And I was like, wait, just what do you want me to say? Like, I don't have time to give, like, your two-hour dissertation about, you know, being a revolutionary. Right. She, she made her own kombucha and made me socks. Yeah, I mean, and... she was at Woodstock. Right. Like, I mean, she's pretty, like, we were grew up in Santa Cruz. Like, my name is Kaj. My sister's name is Java. Right. That's there good. was two rivers, a moonbeam and a star on our block. Do like, you guys do, like, kirtans and stuff? I don't know even know what they are so Hari, Hari Krishna know. Krishna Hari, oh Hari, no no stuff. but there is a Harry Krishna element like in our family like yeah. this woman uh, who's like a cousin now Davashasti like that that exists right that kind of thing yeah, cool. um it was at one point when my mom and I finally reconciled she you know she goes like listen I'm not a hippie, damn it. I'm counterculture. And I was like, that's okay, good. Mom. Now you know. Yeah, now I that's know. That's good. For it's the like record, if, if your mother's listening, yep. we acknowledge your yeah. counterculture. <laughs> and she is. Yeah. And she is. And she's, um, and that's, that is definitely like one of the most beautiful aspects of her is that she refuses to accept the world as it is, like constantly questioning. How does she feel about you being a Navy SEAL? Oh, super You got them Navy her. SEAL, Kaj. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Those are my helmets. You I, do I, like real shit. I don't do, I go to yoga, I go to hot yoga. That's like my, the extent, I used to climb low grade mountains. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> like, a couple of these hot yoga classes, I have felt like ringing that bell. I know? sat with myself for yeah. 10 days once. Yeah, well, it is funny that I did like, when you were describing it, I was thinking about the process of Hell Week and I was thinking about, uh, so Hell Week is some the fit that somewhere between the third and the fifth week of seal training in the first phase of seal training which is the hardest phase where lots of people quit and most people quit during hell week um and it's generally considered 
the hardest week of the hardest military training in the world. Uh, and the vast right. majority of people also quit on the second day. Something yeah. about the adrenaline gets you through the first night and the first day. Um, I think it's just smart. If you quit on the second day, you're like, okay, I got a taste of that. Like, I know I'm not going to finish. Yeah, go out, go out it early. Seems to be, it seems to be sensible. Yeah, although, and then again, there's people who quit, like, you know, closer to the finish don't line. Don't quit on the, like, yeah, if you're like no. nine tenths through, don't do that. Totally. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. So um, there is some parallel there. But uh, yeah, it's funny. I keep, I keep feeling like I want to point out visual references, which is like, must be the TV guy in me, like not yeah, the right. podcast guy. But like, yeah, those are my helmets over there from SEAL training. Each one represents a different phase of training. That green one huh. represents first phase physical conditioning. The blue one represents dive phase or second phase. And then the third one is land warfare. That's the final phase of, of basic underwater demolition seal training. So are those like trophies or symbols or you're no, actually you, wearing the helmets? No, no, you wear the helmets. Why they, are you wearing the helmets? They you, look like old school. Looks yeah. like Civil War stuff. I mean, like, look, a lot of SEAL training is old school, but wow. you, you wear them when you run around so, like, people in your class, you can be identified. Like, oh, there's the first fa the class that's in first phase. Um, cool. So there's a group of, you know, it starts off big. Like, my class started off with 246 guys. So you got 246 guys, you know, running around wearing those helmets in formation, um, and, then, and then it switches over. The helmet, like anything else, becomes a device. Um, it's not to battle protect you like we could go you know gear geek out in the garage and i could show you ballistic helmets well. that you wear f operationally uh these are more ceremonial you have to paint them you can see the stripe on them indicating that i'm an officer and sometimes the instructors to fuck with you will like grab the helmet off your head smash it which means that you're going to be up all night painting the helmet like you know so instead of getting your you know two or three hours of sleep that you'd hope to get you'll get zero hours and well. you know, have a fresh painted helmet yeah. What's, what's Hell Week consist of? Hell Week consists of uh, multiple nights between, uh, you know, five and seven nights um, without sleep. You only sleep probably on total, I don't know the numbers, four or five hours over the course of that week. Uh, wow. The very first night is... What does that divide into nightly? So it's or is not it just nightly. like you're taking naps? Yeah, they'll give you like a two-hour nap or something. Wow. I think according to, to Bud's lore, but I think there's science behind this, um, sometime after 72 hours, you start to get into a place that's cerebrally dangerous without sleeping. And so they have like these mandatory rest periods where they'll like let you nap for an hour to kind of reset that clock. But, <laughs> you know, by the end, by like day five, like you're totally hallucinating. Yeah. You, know, like I, you mentioned REM sleep. If your brain goes, if you don't get REM sleep for long enough, it will start to, to catch up while you're awake exactly. and you'll be driving your car and all of a sudden see like gypsies running over your, you know, your hood. Is that your hallucination of That's my go-to. <laughs> <laughs> That's my go It was a story about your mom being counterculture or something yeah. like a gypsy. <laughs> you see Kaji's mom jumping on your hood. Yeah. I mean, look, I, I don't want to be too PC. In fact, I don't want to be PC at all, but apparently gypsy is also not politically correct. Oh, right. I apologize. It's the Roma people. The Roma people. Which I saw many when I yeah. was in Romania. Yeah, right. Um, but you know what I wanted to circle back to because I think it's like... It's one of the reasons I enjoy our conversation so much, but um, is there's this growing up in Santa Cruz, I'm hyper sensitive to the distinction between like new ideas and new age thinking. There's yeah. a lot of like soft thinking in the kind of new age community and you see it whether you're in Santa Cruz, whether you're in, in Venice and like I think because I grew up around it, I'm not, uh, I'm particularly acerbic to hmm. it right what i am i i like people who are pushing the boundaries of ideas and thinking um but i also see like when it goes like in a different direction and i'm like Psh, like come on like yeah. come on you know the kind of overheard in la kind of stuff yeah you know? i'm a little bit jealous of people like you that have had the opportunity or, or made the choice to do hard things like that and put yourself in an organized situation where it's like, I, I've never, I mean, I've done like some raves and stuff like that where I was up for a while, but I've never, you know, I've, I've like I said, I used to be in like mountaineering and rock climbing and stuff like that, but nothing to the same degree. Yeah. Well, it's hard to put yourself through that. Yeah. It has to be in pursuit of a, a larger 
purpose, right? Or else like at some point like rational thinking and behavior takes over and you're like, wait, why am I doing this? Like I just ran like 40 miles with like boats and logs. Like this doesn't make any sense. This isn't good for me, right? They say this again is, you know, Bud's mythology like, but you know, they say hell week takes like four years off your life or whatever, right? Like (laughs) there's no reason to actually do that unless you have like some larger mission, in mind yeah but then it probably enriches the next 80 like many things in life like there are things yeah that we we pay our dues now and uh I, i'm always thinking about this distinction between you know life quantitatively how many years did you live like did yeah. you live to 110 or you know what medicine is starting to awaken to these this idea of total quality life years like what is what is the quality of your life during whatever time you're on this you know small blue planet yeah it's amazing all the things like you you know how many things have you done where you you look back and you're like oh man i wish i did that 10 years ago totally changed my whole perception i was a total asshole for the last yeah you know 30 years and then that happened yeah you know it's like it's interesting like what's what's in the you know, in the future to come where I'm like, oh, I'm definitely not thinking right now. I'm sure for me, those are usually things like, you know, my, my crazy friend Brock, who was like telling me to invest in this Bitcoin thing oh, 10 dude. years ago. And I was like, Brock, like, like, this is nuts. Like I'm, I, I'm not putting my hard earned money into this right. <laughs> crazy thing that you could barely explain to me. You know, did like, you do it? What? No, I oh. didn't do it. Like I'm a super conservative investor, Dang. and yeah, and, but Brock put a hundred grand in. Oh, good. Turned it into four billion dollars. Whoa! Like, yeah, Brock. Go Brock. Damn. You rock, Brock. Four billion. Four, and then billion it got cut down to two billion and less, whatever. Yeah, yeah, but like they're you know, poor guy. Yeah. Jeez. So you, his, his home's right down uh, the canal. Oh, that's actually. good. Yeah, yeah. Brock. We, we could row the, the boat. We down should there. row down to Brock, but then it'd be a date. That's your yeah. move. Yeah. <laughs> I know your <laughs> intentions if you take me in the, yeah. in, the in the rowboat. Yeah, yeah. So you got. So you were doing. How long are you? St- you're once as Navy SEAL, always Navy SEAL, I guess. Yeah. Are you like active duty? Can you be like I called not, upon? I, I am off of active duty and I until very recently uh, stayed in the SEAL reserves, which a lot of people aren't aware that um, there are SEAL reserve units, but they are. They're, they're relatively new. Um, they became important as guys were getting out circa 2007, 2008, 2009. There was kind of a brain drain in the SEAL teams of guys getting out putting their skills to use in the private sector. Um, So the leadership, uh, specifically a guy named Admiral Olson, really kicked off this idea of what he called SEAL for Life. Um, Mm -hmm. And he wanted to make sure he he drew a circle around and was able to capture, like, all of these guys that we had invested all of this money and training into and could still retain some value from them for the community. What's it cost? What's um, the, I know that that there is a cost. I've heard it. I should, I've heard $2 million. Damn! But... I should be. I should drill down on that. Um, I don't want to be quoted on on too crazy, real, but it's it's definitely seven figures. I, I don't know what what exactly it is, but Whoa. it's a lot of money. It's a lot of money, and it's a lot of time. There are very few seals. There are very few like active trigger puller seals. They're very. They're even less seal reservists. Um, so my story is, yeah, I, I did. Um, I got off active duty in '05, and then I went to graduate school. Uh, where I was completely out. But in 07, I came, I wanted just, I needed a break from military affiliation. Uh, But in 07, I came back into the reserve community. Uh, And then I've been, because the demand is so high for uh, for SEALs, um, because the operational tempo overseas, I've been kind of jumping back and forth across the line uh, between my civilian work and and my military work. So I'll have to go back and uh, go to Africa and and do some work. Is there a tangible... (laughs) characteristic that you feel or, or, or sensation that you feel like you've gathered from, from doing SEAL training and all that, that somebody like, you know, me hasn't been able to access or hasn't access. I mean, it's weird when I, when I, I relate it like to me specifically, but just like, is there something that stands out of like before I did that versus after I did that change of perception of things? Well, in, I, in general, I think there's a tremendous amount, like being a SEAL is the seminal experience of my life and it defines a lot of who I am and how I operate in the world. Hmm. I think there are analogs 
to being a SEAL all throughout the civilian world. And there are ways to capture um, a, a lot of the intrinsic value of both our training and my overseas experience through different experiences. There's, um, you know, whether that's the camaraderie of, of being on a sports team together or mm -hmm. climbing a mountain together, um, like that brotherhood. Uh, I think you can. I think you can emulate and replicate in the civilian world. I think there's a lot of really positive things uh, that you can do in terms of being mission oriented, in terms of leadership principles that come from the ci right. civilian world that are applicable, um, or that come from the SEAL community that are applicable in the civilian world. I would say. So I think there's a lot of positive flow between that kind of Maginot line of, of military, the civil military divide. Um, there are probably some things that you wouldn't want to have from my experience of being a SEAL. You know, uh, June 28th, 2005, like I buried 11 friends who were killed in Afghanistan. Um, you know, uh, the Extortion 17 mission had multiple friends on. For, for a guy my age, I just turned uh, 40, like, you know, I've probably like carried too many coffins and I've been to too many friends funerals. Like we, because we have been so uh, aggressive and the operational tempo has been so high over the last, over the two longest wars in American history. Um, I, I feel, I don't have empirical data to back this up, but I feel like I have been disproportionately exposed to death and injury <laughs> of many of my friends um, that, there isn't really a civilian analog for that outside of some like incredibly tragic circumstance. Hmm. You seem so lighthearted. Well, yes, I, I think lighthearted is a good way to go through life. I, <laughs> I, I think, look, I, I, I don't know that I can articulate this well, but I, I feel it deeply. I think it's pot, a lot of my f friends have suffered and a lot of military personnel have suffered in their civilian transitions. Um, they had really tough times overseas and like, look, I had tough times overseas. I think it's also possible to, we all know about PTSD, post-traumatic stress yeah. uh, disorder. Um, Get it from big wave surfing too. Really? Yeah. Yeah. I, I believe that. Well, originally. There's like a come down off of it. A lot of people will experience like this, like depression after doing like surfing pay here or something amazing. like that. Amazing. Uh, well, I mean, originally like PTS comes from, I believe from uh, domestic violence survivors, right? So yeah, it's essentially that. a way, it's the way your body deals with trauma, right? Psychologically deals with trauma, right? And so it's maybe magnified in a, in a combat setting. But I think conversely that it's also possible to grow from your combat experiences. And I think I, I learned a ton from my time overseas and, and I came back and I had a, a really beautiful transition as I was able to go to graduate school at a, a, like an amazing institution. And I, think that kind of exposure is the best kind of soft landing um, from your active duty time. It also has the added benefit of increasing your social networks. I've been able to do a lot of work in veterans philanthropy that uh, allows me not just to continue to serve in uniform when I'm overseas um, as a reservist or mobilized to active duty, but also continue to serve my community and my community of veterans. And I think that gives me a sense of purpose and mission that's helped me um, remain positive and buoyant and then like frankly like just like a little bit of perspective right <laughs> like yeah. i'm not sure i should have lived past 35 right. but like i'm here it's the extra credit man right it's all in You're the black it. i'm all in the black right? <laughs> it's all a dream <laughs> yeah like it's all bonus <laughs> it's all bonus time at this point right like i've had parachutes not open right <laughs> like things blow up helicopters crash right you've been in the helicopter yeah 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 jesus yeah i've been in two helicopter incidents you What's, know? can you what, what the hell happened uh, one of them <laughs> was an incident in training where uh, a guy, I don't know, if, is Mike still active duty? Anyways, I, I won't say his last name, but his name's Mike. And this guy, Mike, uh, was, we were doing this thing called Helo Cast and Recovery. And it's basically a methodology of picking combat swimmers up out of the water quickly with a helo, uh, with a helicopter. So the helicopter drags um, this caving ladder behind it at at 10 miles an hour and, and 10 knots. Um, and then your swimmers are in the water in a line and you hook the helicopter and then climb up into it so that you could pick up a bunch of seals from 
from a, a maritime mission. And uh, we were doing this, and um, I remember, like, climbing up uh, into the ladder, and this guy, Mike, um, uh, was at the base, and he had just hooked the ladder, and I was right next to uh, another uh, frogman buddy of mine, another officer who's, like, my best friend through training, and he was looking down at the ladder, and all of a sudden there's this noise, like, like, the noise you never want to hear in a helicopter. No. And in a helicopter, like, noise is life. Uh, I mean, air uh, altitude is life because you can auto-rotate. So the pilot, like, rams on the collective. It shoots up. What does like, collective mean? The collective is the – it's kind of like the the joystick that they use to fly the helicopter. Oh, okay. It's not the actual steering mechanism, but I think it changes the tilt of the rotor blades and stuff yeah. um, and changes the pitch. So they, like – they fly up on the collective, so the helicopter goes like from 10 feet off the ground to 300 feet in the air over the Coronado Bridge with Mike Gall like hanging from the bottom of the ladder. Wow. Swinging. Wow. Yeah, like out of a action hero movie. And yeah, so anyways, I was in an incident like that. I was in another incident where a 60 was landing on a helicopter and, and fell short um, and, and landed in the water. Uh, landed being... <laughs> The loose definition of landed, smashed into the water. Um, yeah, those those birds fall, fall out of the air, man. They fall out of the air. Yeah. I barely understand the aerodynamics of how they fly anyway. So. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah, it's a weird... It's complex stuff. It's Original weird. planes were supposed to... We tried flapping them, I think. Oh, you mean like <laughs> like Wright Brothers, North Carolina, yeah. to uh, emulate nature? Yeah, yeah. It's a natural first approach. That That's makes what sense. That's you think. The Wright Brothers were bike mechanics, right? I think that's right. It's kind of an interesting thing. I was reading something of, of the, the value of, it's kind of like divergent thinking, like by you approaching a problem, not being like an expert at it, in some senses, you actually have a higher likelihood of, of coming up with new new insights that haven't been done before because you're like, you don't, you're not in the dogma. It's kind well, of interesting. To, to come full circle to the conversation uh, about being a Renaissance man, this is like part of my, you know, philosophical underpinning of this approach to life is that I think there's incredible value of being a subject matter expert and having domain expertise. Yep. And I think what that allows you to do within that silo of information in your lane is you make what we call technical innovation. Like um, if you are the world's foremost scholar on, I don't know, like metallurgy right like you can continue to like gradually make improvements like over time because you have this new material and stuff but i feel like that like transformative innovation like real quantum leaps in progress quite often come from like a, a mashup of of two different domains coming together and right. borrowing the best practices and principles from one domain and combining it with ideas from another domain. That's when you get like in a primordial soup metaphor, a collision of these atoms and like big, big ideas hmm. happen. Um, and I, and I like that. I like that personally, you know, when I'm thinking about, you know, you know, when I can use my expertise in, you know, national security and then like, think about all the work and research that I've done in the criminal justice world and then cross pollinate like those principles together to come up with something new that advances one of the, the mediums. Yeah. Buddies, Hunter, Hunter Matz and Brian County called idea sex. Yeah. Well, that, that is, <laughs> what? I, I, Take you, these two you, ideas out in the, out in the rowboat and yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Take it down you, there. You just let me go on that long <laughs> soliloquy when we could have just had idea sex? Idea yeah. sex. Yeah. Uh, it's a real thing. New, it's like it's new spawn cool. comes out of that. Totally. Can you talk a bit about, uh, did you experience PTSD? Would you say that that's like a tangible, like, yeah, that was a thing? Uh, I, I don't know. I think no. Yeah, right. All those My things have been no. blurry. Yeah, no. I Like, look, I I think I'm okay. And there's there's a lot of interesting Science, you know, two people can have the identical combat experiences, can be sitting right next to each other in the Humvee, you know, go through an ambush, like go through an IED, whatever. And one person can come out like absolutely fine and adjusted and transition to life in the civilian world. Mm. And the other person, and I say person purposefully in this case, man, woman, right? There's a lot of women on the on the front lines these days, um, 
can come out totally fucked up and fucked up for life, right? And they come back and they self-medicate and they, and they do all um, all of these, you know, all these negative behaviors, right? And so what that suggests is that there is some that it's not necessarily really about the experience that there's some latent resiliency and capacity f- different varying levels of capacity for resiliency built in to human beings. And one of the, the questions that people at the forefront of this, these kind of research questions are, are asking is, um, can we build resiliency? You know, is it, uh, how can we arm people with resiliency as body armor before they have these traumatic experiences downrange and overseas? Um, there's some fascinating new stuff coming out about it. Yeah, attunement at a, uh, at a young age is a big thing. So a mother like really connecting and attuning with mm-hmm. the child. Also, uh, contact is a big thing. So there's like studies around uh, rat pups and the the uh, amount of whatever the grooming or licking, whatever that's, whatever that there's a term for that, right? When the... Or like licking the pup. Right. You know what I'm talking about. You know, it's contact. Right. You know, so that like taking care and that, that actually having that physical yes. expression of love and care. I'm like massaging a pillow right now. <laughs> um, it's creepy. Um, you know, but that's shown to make those those rat pups and humans, um, but in the studies, rat pups uh, more well adapted and, and more so when, when stressful situations happen, they're like, okay, cool. Like I've, I have this insulation. Yeah. Whereas if you grow up kind of dry, then, you know, you're closer to the bone. And I completely believe that. And I could probably like draw a bunch of like anecdotal examples from, from people I know. Right. And quite often, you know, sort of paradoxically, sometimes the same situations that drive people into the military are not necessarily like the familial background situations that would be most supportive of having created like a resilient it's kind self. Of a, yeah. Right? I was, I was like, hearing that as I was saying yeah. that. I was like, I bet you that's not always true in that situation. Right. And there's all these, these old, you know, cliches, you know, in World War II era where it's like, well, son, you can go to jail or you can enlist, right? You know? Yeah. And so they, they end up enlisting from a pragmatic perspective um, because from a, from a DOD outlook, you know, they can't go back and, and really change people's childhood. Some of the the very practical measures that they're looking at are uh, one, being able to identify and to be able to classify whether people have that initial Mm. resiliency or some kind of innate resiliency built in. And then secondly, there's some evidence that pre-exposure to traumatic events actually helps your mind cognitively um, build defense mechanisms against more severe trauma right. so it's like a muscle exactly train it beforehand right so if it feels to me like like a combination of of as a rat pup you were licked and cared for yeah. and you've been exposed to some shit in like titrates you yes. know like enough that you're able to actually assimilate yeah it, that's and it's 100 percent true and while i'm saying it out loud i feel like sort of morally responsible to also say that that the I think we want to build super soldiers, right? Yeah. But war is hell, and like what happens in war is horrible, and there's a reason that people have PTS, post traumatic stress, right? Is because you know, human beings psychologically and biologically, like, are not designed to, to kill and to see right. other human beings killed, dismembered, you know, mutilated whatever. Um, so we could provide all of the, um, prophylaxis in the world. Right. But ultimately like it's the policy of conducting war that is really what's breaking people. And, um, and look, I'm, I'm not a peacenik obviously, (laughs) right. It goes, uh, without saying, but I do as, as someone who has deployed overseas, um, I think there's a reason that warriors are the most reluctant to go to war, and it's because we understand the consequences of it. Hmm. Yeah. Why do we go to war if it's not... It's interesting when we say things like, like, you know, whatever, artificial flavors, it's not natural, or like this technology, it's not natural. It's like, well, we fucking made it, so it's natural. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, this is kind of my whole thing about, like, new age thinking, right? Like, now we're off the war topic. Like, this is my whole... It, like think about new age thinking, like, uh, and my uh, my sister's a um, 
my sister is a, uh, a, a doctor, an amazing little doctor, and little because she's small, unlike us. Yeah. She's small. And she, she always gets mad when she, she's like, gosh, all your friends are so tall. Like, <laughs> <laughs> she would hate to meet you. You would fall right in with my tall group of friends. Oh, that's you know? good. That's good. Um, and, you know, she's always <laughs> Another saying. Another one. <laughs> yeah, well, there's always these things like where people are like making this thing like, oh, well, it's it's natural, right? And, you know, so therefore it's organic. And she's like, look, like I will walk you into the forest and show you some mushrooms that will kill you within like two and a half seconds. Right. Totally organic, totally natural. Like she's a toxo- toxicologist also. Like, you know, toxico- toxins don't care whether they were organically or synthetically made. Like bad for the body is still bad for the body. And I, this is when I talk about kind of the softness of new age thinking. Sometimes I feel like in communities like Venice and Santa Cruz and stuff, people like really fall into that trap, you know? Yeah. Um, I like that you didn't label Santa Monica, which is where I live. I'm like outside of all that. Oh, dude. <laughs> you're, you're so vanilla. So you're so vanilla up north there in Santa Monica. It's <laughs> true. It's true. So, you know, I think about that sometimes of, of like, is war an, a, a natural part of being a human or is it some aberration mutation? Like, is it inherent in, in like, the, the health of, of humanity yeah. for us to fucking kill each other? It's, it's probably, like, the biggest, like, one of the, like, bigger sort of philosophical rifts between my mom and myself. My mom is, like, an outright pacifist, and she believes that violence is never, like, justified uh, by any means. I tend to think more um, that uh, war or conflict or violence to some degree is is inevitable and it's part of the nature of uh, of of being a human and I would sort of cite like lots of anthropological evidence right I think if Chris Ryan were here he would be able to talk a lot about like you know warring factions in early humans and yeah. stuff and there's a, a lot of evidence of that that kind of conflict um, but yeah I don't know, man. It. I'll tell you, as a veteran of the, you know, two longest wars in American history, like it certainly seems pretty damn inevitable, and in that like we haven't, we haven't evolved. Like, you know, the mechanisms have have evolved. Like the, um, you know, the reasons are different, right? But you know, World War Two is was it World War Two or is World War One? Like, they all start to blur, right? Like the war to end all wars, right? Yeah, right. And like that shit hasn't happened. Um, so, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I, it feels like a downer, but I, 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 whether whether war is inevitable or not, I do think we have to live in a world where um, violence uh, and conflict exist. So we have to figure out like what are the what are the the mores and and what are the the boundaries around those two subjects. If Chris were here, he might say something along the lines of of property being. Like uh, one of I don't know what he would actually say, but I mean I've, I feel like I've heard him talk about this yeah. this subject, but that that would be a, a likely response, you know, if we if we if we truly shared everything and you know in like sex at dawn perspective, like including like each other, yeah, um, then there's not it's like I don't want you to blow up my land or kill my sister or something like that because like it's she's incredible. your sister too and we're, we we share all this. Once it's like well this is mine. Then all of a sudden it creates this interesting... Com- but then the question is, where does this is mine come from? Right. And also, like, and less so money, but, like, you know, if... I mean, Chris uses, you know, the animal model and the bonobo model quite a bit as um, a catalyst for understanding, like, our, our modern behaviors and stuff. And, like, look, like, there's violence in bonobo society. Mm-hmm. Less so than chimpanzee, um, but it's it's violent and there's a different kind of violence right. and like in some ways like violence is a part of nature if you uh you know if you watch animals hunt each other like yeah, that's an inherently violent act you know even uh i don't know i was i was free diving for lobsters the other day and like it requires violence and aggression to take another being's life no matter what mm. Mm whether that's a human to human or, or human to animal or animal to animal. So I do think there is some intrinsic nature in terms of violence and aggression. Um, but then there's probably like a whole social construct around it. Um, I tend to ask 
questions about you know, motivations for violence and, and questions like who wins and who loses, things like that. Right. Yeah. So what's... Uh, As a way of unpacking um, what's happening. So I don't know your, if we can stop violence completely. And just to be like perfectly clear, like I believe there are times when force is required to do good in the world. Yeah, I get that. I live in, you know, I don't know that I live in perpetual fear, but I never want to be thought of as the good man who does nothing. Right. Sort of that passivity that we talked about before. Um, You know, like if there's, there's something wrong, uh, I want to, I want to attack it and fix it as a problem. The classic international relations example that I use is, um, the Rwandan genocide, uh, where the um, the Hutu power structure murdered approximately 800,000 people in somewhat under three months, mostly by machete, frankly. One of the mechanisms for launching Hutu power during the Rwandan genocide, and Bill Clinton, by the way, if you if you ever if you ever talk to to Bill or um, uh, or you know considers this one of his like regrets from his presidency that they didn't intervene or intercede sooner in Mm. the Rwandan genocide. They watched it happen. There's lots of reasons for that going back to Somalia and and all of this other stuff. Uh, But um, he considers that a failure of his administration. It would have been really simple to send like a team of missions are never simple, but so erase that. It would have been possible, right, uh, to send a, a group of guys like me and a group of pipe hitters to go in and take out the radio towers that were used to broadcast um, all the messages from the Hutu power structure. Uh, that was the real mechanism for inciting violence. That's a very tactical, surgical approach to um, – and look, it may not have stopped the genocide, but it certainly would have like slowed its progress. Yeah. Um, so anyways, there, there are places in the world where, um, I think kinetic action has to happen. If, as you're in that situation and we can, we can wrap up soonish, you, you gotta be out of here at a, a specific, whatever we've been doing for. I, I'm cool. You, whatever, whatever serves you. Yeah. I just got to prep for speaking of killing things. Uh, yeah. Speaking of man on animal violence, <laughs> I'm, about to I'm kill prepping some shit. for uh, a big spearfishing trip this weekend. Yeah. Good. <laughs> I'd be interested the, cause that's such a rare experience to be, I don't know what a pipe hitter is exactly. I'd love to hear what that is, but if you are called on to that mission, if that's what, what the term would be, um, what's like your mindset upon getting that call? If it is a call or message or whatever, um, leading up into that being in the, plane or whatever the hell is you're going over there you in that a little bit yeah sure um well so one one thing that i should uh I, like maybe a not super well-known distinct distinction about the seal community um and it's a subtlety but i think it's an important subtlety is that the seal community is comprised like all of the military of officers and enlisted uh, guys, so the officers are kind of the the leadership class an analogy might be uh the medical community, doctors and nurses. So you have like, if you're on a trauma team, you have the doctor leading it. And then you have um, nurses who have specific roles, you know, during that code or, or, or whatever. Um, same thing in the SEAL community, the officer enlisted ratio is about one to three. So you have one officer for every three enlisted guys, SEAL platoon, traditionally 16 guys, two to three officers, the rest enlisted guys. Uh, and so I was an officer. I went through SEAL training uh, as a young ensign, newly commissioned. Uh, I continued on in my service. I, I now hold the rank of lieutenant commander. Uh, so part of my role is mission planning, um, and it's a, it's a leadership role. And so, uh, and it on the ground, it doesn't matter that much, right? Like every SEAL shoots, every SEAL jumps, every SEAL dives, you know, you're right there uh, in the stack with everybody else. Um, so it's not like you're sitting back in the talk, the tactical operations center, you know, drinking coffee, like while the boys go out and kick down the door, but it certainly, and it's particularly the culture of the SEAL teams is that officers lead from the front and that mm. they're, they're deeply involved. In fact, it's the only way to earn the respect of the guys because right. it's a very non-hierarchical culture. It's a very flat culture. So, um, you know, it, unlike traditional military structures, like the guys, you know, they don't, 
say sir in the same way they don't salute you you know they generally don't salute on seal bases well, and stuff like that so um it's a much more like team of equals kind of approach um but one of the roles of officers is mission planning and so when i think about mission planning i think about the five phases of any mission um uh, insertion uh how are we going to start to get there how are we going to uh, infiltration, how are we going to move towards the target? The AO, which is called the actions on the objective, the third phase of any mission. And then if you're doing your job right as an officer, you think about like, how the hell are we going to get off the X? That's called the exfiltration phase. And then finally the extraction. How are we going to get on the bird and go home? And quite often, interestingly enough, the um, insertion, infiltration, Exfiltration and extraction components of the mission are far and away the most complicated components of any mission, <laughs> right? Sometimes the stuff we have to do to get to a target uh, is, you know, a halo jump or an underwater combat dive on a Draeger on a pure oxygen rebreather, right? Trekking through the jungle. So for me, when I'm thinking about a mission, it's it's usually not as simple as, you know, hey, we're just going to get on the bird and we're going to roll out and go, right? Quite often, it's not that we don't dirt dive the hell out of in practice the actions on the objective, whether that's a reconnaissance, taking a taking photographs, whether that's hitting a house and trying to grab an HVT. We we go through those that training and, and that practice a lot, but we just as often have to prepare and then from a leadership perspective, think about those other components of the mission. And then the final thing that I'll say about that is then there's this comms architecture, communications architecture that sits on top of the entire mission and makes it work. So as, as an officer, quite often when I'm first getting on the bird or the truck or, uh, you know, donning the Drager apparatus or on the boat or on the submarine to be at the beginning phase of any mission, I'm thinking about like all of the incredible responsibilities in terms of the entire horizon of the mission from getting in safely to the actions to time on target, how long we spend in the on the actual target, on the actual objective, um, to getting out, and then communicating both internally within the team and externally to all of these other assets simultaneously. So uh, the Zero Dark Thirty is, you know, you see everybody creeping through the compound and shooting the bad guys, uh, but the reality is that the modern-day battle space is incredibly complicated and complex. Mm. And one small example might be, you know, you... Uh, on a say you're on a mission in Afghanistan and you have your platoon and you're communicating internally um, with your commu- with your platoon, but you also might be communicating separately on a different channel externally and often on missions like I'll have headsets on with multiple channels, so I'll be listening to the internal uh, platoon team communication in my right ear, but in my left ear I'll be listening to. Um, the uh, the overhead assets, the fast movers, which are the, the jets who are providing cover for you. You'll be talking back to oh. the tactical operations center, and you might have a JTAC in your platoon who's you know doing a call for fire, who's calling a JDAM, which is a big bomb, right, over on some target somewhere else. And just to add to the complexity of the picture, like these are not all Americans. Right, like if you listen to radio traffic on a mission in in Afghanistan, you might have like an Italian JTAC controller talking to a NATO French jet with a um, Polish QRF quick reaction force on standby and an American helo. So you have all these crazy accents chattering on the radio all to accomplish one mission. And that's the modern battle space domain, which has gotten incredibly complicated and sophisticated. Have you had situations where, um, the, what do you call it? X full getting out, uh, getting out. Yes. Yeah. Where exfiltration. You, exfiltration is like, Oh fuck. How are we oh, going to exfiltrate? Totally. Uh, you know, you know what we like to say in, in mission planning? Fuck like, is a military term, by the way, that was a bomb is coming in. I think it was world war two. 
Really? Yeah. So when a bomb was coming in, so that was in touch. That's not just me being lowbrow. Yeah. That I was mean, legit. Yeah. That's why I said it. <laughs> that's that's why totally said, that's why, why I said, said it. it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, that sounds like that could yeah. really suck. Uh, it, it, it can really <laughs> suck. You know, the adage we like to say in mission planning is like, no battle plan survives the first shot. And yeah, right. God, that's true. Right? right. So you have all these ideas, which is why, again, from a mission planning perspective, like contingency plans are incredibly important. So you need a primary, a secondary, and a t- often a tertiary extract option. Um, and you got to be able to make like good real-time calls and decisions um, about which one of those you're going to execute because, like, if you make the wrong call, like, people die. Um, And that is a grave responsibility when you're 23, 24 years old. It's probably an annoying question, but are there there any specific instances that stand out that the exfiltration was a a special pain in the ass? Hmm. I'd I'd have to think about it. Or something, yeah, don't worry about it, or something went wrong where it's like, you know, you know, I mean, I guess probably something went wrong is probably like almost every every time time. you went and did a thing. Yeah, every time, (laughs) all the time, every time. (laughs) That just sounds, because you're in a foreign land, you know, with a bunch of people that their intention is to kill you, rightfully so, because, you know, your intentions are, you know, it's like it would would only make sense. Um, It's just like, fuck, man, like I got lost in the mall when I was like six and you know shit my pants yeah <laughs> like, <laughs> totally that sin- i mean totally totally and you're just like and then it's you know and it's night and then like the you know the gps isn't working and the and the comms guy can't get like a radio sat shot like it all like it's always you know and, and it's why you have to be like incredibly adaptable and it's also um why it's frankly the reason that special operations community exists the history of the special operations community socom itself is that it came off of a fuck up yeah right uh the military term yeah exactly (laughs) 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 oh god i hope all your podcasts aren't this heavy like how was your afternoon like a lot of war dude it's so it's i find this i mean it's just I don't have the opportunity to access this. You know, my life is freaking building a salad at Erewhon and going to yoga and then reading about the power of play. Yeah. My life's a bunch of bullshit. <laughs> I'm incredibly know, grateful for my bullshit. If, I don't know. Like, if, if you ever need to call for, like, a hot extract at Erewhon, I got gotcha. you. Send the in, send I think the that stuff's in. important, man. There's a book called Paradise Made in Hell that I'm sh- I bet you're familiar with that no, one. You ever uh-uh, heard of that one? Uh-uh, so me. it's all so it's all about um, kind of this, but how going through these really. I hope I'm not harsh in your mellow before your big trip. By the way, I really appreciate you like going into all this stuff. Um, you know, this is like no way. oh, good, perfect, no. perfect good. Um, but so Paradise Made in Hell is a, a book about different people's experiences where they went through uh, like like traumatic, in quotations, experiences that happened to be the most valuable experiences, experiences of their life. And they finally felt brotherhood and they felt, or sisterhood or whatever. And they finally feel that connection and what it feels to like really like viscerally live, you know, in those moments. Because I'd imagine in that situation, like you checking how many notifications you have on your Instagram would have so little relevance in that situation. Right. Whereas when we're here by the, you know, the river and there's the weed whacker going, it's like, oh, take a look at my Instagram, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> totally. <laughs> totally. But I mean, don't you think that's part of the reason like it's incumbent upon us if we want to live fully robust lives is to, to challenge our comfort zone because it gives us this great perspective yeah. on like what matters, like what shit actually matters. Yeah. It's being able, it's like psychedelics. Do you have experience with psychedelics or is it something you talk about or whatever? I'm happy to talk yeah. about it. Um, I'm happy to talk about my non experience. Let yeah, me yeah. pontificate about something I, I know okay, nothing you've about. Okay. That's it. That's interesting. But yeah, well, the truth is experience. I've never done any drugs. I am oh, uh, from Santa Cruz. Alcohol? And have ne- no, that is true. I have. Oof, I alcohol is one of the that. most insidious drugs. It is. No, if no, we no, don't put alcohol on the drug table, that's I, like, I, I guess what, I, are we, what are we saying here? I got, I get chastised all the time for making 
making that shorthand mistake. In it. And I deserve to be chastised for it. I have never it's a done, hell of a drug, alcohol. <laughs> I have never done any illicit drugs. Okay. Um, and I've never even smoked pot, which I know makes me like the oddest of odd Santa Cruz ducks. Yeah. Right? And barely. Santa like, Cruz Venice. Yeah, I, I know. They should that's like good. exile me right now, right? No, that's like, good. We need but it. the truth is I've, I've had a security clearance since I was 17 right. years old. And like, look, oh my God probably gonna start another maternal fight here but like look my mom smokes enough pot for the whole family like <laughs> that's good. it's fine like, i think there's something to that idea actually it, it's, it's not a judgment but so yeah. that's so that's the thing and we can we can wrap up here and jeffy but the um i think that that's a big thing with people that do use a lot of like psychoactive stuff whatever you know fill in the blank thing psilocybin lsd um but is is being competent or fluent between both worlds mm. You know, so if all, if you're like, like I was talking to, uh, do you know Neil Strauss? Of course, right? I know yeah, him quite well. Oh, yeah. good, perfect. Yeah. So I was just, just um, did a recording thing with him like like three days ago. Great. And this is one of the things that, that he, barring from him, is like sometimes the plant medicine people can only hang out with the other plant medicine oh, people. Right, right, right. You know, because they're like, they've, they've pulled the veil back and it's yeah. like, it's like, yeah. no, shut up. Yeah. You know, it's, it's like, totally. how do you, how do you be bilingual between that? Like, yeah. that's the real value. Yeah. Yes, I'd imagine it's similar with your experiences. I think so. No, I think so. Absolutely. Um, And I've always thought like that part of, I mean, you know, in my civilian life, like um, a storyteller and um, a filmmaker and I'm a war correspondent. And I've always thought that like part of my job was, uh, and especially because I often focus on conflict and national security issues, I've always thought that like part of my job was to help explain you know, frankly, this like foreign, often unnavigable, scary world of of war and conflict and war and peace, um, you know, to an audience back here and so that we can understand these these things that we're engaged in to kind of unpack them. Yeah, it's like yin and yang. That's hanging out Mm -hmm. on the floating library boat dock. It's pretty in. I'm so glad that you're stoked on it. (laughs) I really am. Yeah. I've been stoked on it before walking by and being like, they have a floating book. Now I get to know the... I did read the Michael Pollan book, by the way. I had to change your mind. Actually, my dad read it first. uh, And and he's like, you got to read this. And then uh, Kyle also recommended it. And here we are. And I read it. I thought it was quite excellent. Psychedelics are powerful, man. It's one of the most powerful emotional, psychological tools I think that we have access to. Yeah. I think consistency is a really powerful tool too. Um, Like spending time with yourself and meditation and all that stuff. But as far as like, if it was like a, like a special ops military type thing, it's like, it's like the big bomb. (laughs) <laughs> you know, it's <laughs> it's the JDAM. Yeah. Wow. Okay. You know, so, so like, I don't think it's necessary all the time, but it's like when you're in that like a deep psychedelic kind of thing where you really like you really truly are like merging with you know everything. You yeah. know, like your body disappears, and if you start to you know what's it called synesthesia, where you start to you know see right. see colors or or see sounds or what you know all that stuff. It's like. Yeah. um it's just a whole nother world, man. Or man, like just sign on the bottom line and give yourself a little hell week. Get a little hell well, week. Well, that's what up I was saying. You. When I see no, when I yeah. see people jumping out of a helicopter, like that's what I that's what I see. I'm like, oh, it's the same shit. Yeah. You know, it's like when you when you like sign up and you're like, okay, we're gonna do this ayahuasca ceremony, and you like drink the cup. Yeah, it's like you're literally stepping out of the plane. Yeah. Right. So the plane's what you know. You're on this ground. You're like, yeah. okay, I get it. I'm drinking my mate, you know, yeah, like yeah. I'm reading my book. And you're like, okay, do you want to step out and like yeah. see what that is? Like, okay, well. <laughs> but I think there's different avenues to it. Right. I don't think it needs to be ayahuasca. You know, I think it can be like, yeah. whatever. Yeah. Well, I mean, even on a very literal interpretation of, of hallucinating, I suspect that like there's some neurochemical process that's happening that's creating hallucinations nations right yeah, like whether it's because i didn't sleep for seven days right it was like running around in hell week or whether it's because oh, we like fast forwarded it yeah. because we did psilocybin it's like probably the same neurochemical process it would arguably we get some of the same benefits out of it yeah i was reading about that with um what is it called when they're lo- doing like the g-force training where you're like strapped in and oh, spinning yeah. around real fast apparently people end up um it's like regular for people to get hallucinations from those experiences. I think, I mean, I don't know what the hell I'm talking about. Some shit that I read. Um, but I think it's, I mean, that's an interesting thing with like the kind of resistance that culturally 
you know, there's taboo around eating the, the mushroom or the, you know, whatever the thing is. Yeah. But we do all these other kinds of hallucinations. <laughs> sort of like, my, like, I've never done any drugs. Like, right. Let's go get a tequila. Your life is a yeah. drug. What are yeah. you talking about? <laughs> right. Anyways, thanks for doing this, man. This is really cool. This is amazing. Fucking yeah. really, really appreciate yeah. getting the... Yeah, and thanks for the, the session. That was really wonderful. Oh, getting the, the flying stuff. Loved oh, we can it. do more. Yeah, yeah, let's do more, man. It's a good it. thing. Um, how do people learn more about your stuff? What's like the best access point for, um, for you? Uh, I got a website, kajlarson.com. Needs a little updating. Uh, all the social channels, I do all that. Um, and, you know, I always have new content coming out um cool. i got some i'm working on a, a big project right now as well so that'll be out uh sometime next year new new docuseries so sweet is there like a go-to docu something or some type of like piece of content that you're especially proud of uh you know the funny part about this content creation business is like you can only remember the last thing you did right yeah, you're right. only as good as the last thing you did right. uh i'm really proud of some of the work i i did at Vice as a correspondent for the HBO show. I was one of the, um, I was the only journalist uh, in northern Nigeria in the fight against Boko Haram. Uh, so I was able to sneak in to northern Nigeria to a place called Maduguri in Borno State, which is where all the fighting was going on, and and show some stuff that nobody else had been able to see. Interview Boko Haram commanders. Uh, so I'm super proud of that. And um, yeah, uh, you know, I got a little something. For everything, if you're into social justice and criminal justice, I, I got a couple serious documentaries um, about the prison system. Um, you know, I even produced that show Lock Up. Like, so occasionally people will be like, it, it's like a show that now it's on Netflix, I think, and was originally on MSNBC for like 17 seasons. But people are always telling me like, they're like, oh, I was watching TV Saturday night, I fell asleep, and then I like heard your voice, like and there you were, like in in some prison or something. So that's cool. Yeah, I. Uh, yeah, I'm into that, and uh, I actually just did a, I, I just did a, a, a movie, like all kinds of stuff, you know. Like, That's good, man. I, I I pimp it on the gram and on the <laughs> Facebook and the the, t the twittering, less twittering. Actually, no Twitter really. Twitter stuff. I don't believe in it. Yeah, I don't. I love think it. it's. I think it's. I think it's bad for ever us. since they ever since they switched over well i think a lot of things are bad for us in the, in the social media world but ever since they switched it off of being 140 characters i'm like all right i'm over it i thought it was cool where it was forcing you into like creating like a little yeah you know, i like i like the it's confinement a place now oh yeah that's, that's my too. real i don't pay enough attention to, to, to know yeah there's a mike catherwood or you met him before mm -hmm. oh he's dope he's uh he does he co-hosts the Dr. Drew something Oh, I love show Drew. And Drew's all a friend stuff. of mine. Yeah, we were friends from CNN. Yeah. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Yeah, sweet. So, Mike, you got to meet Mike. He's rad. He lives nearby here as well. Um, but he was saying, he had some really sage advice. He said, Instagram is from a boner, and then Twitter is from a, from a mind. Yeah. And so he's... <laughs> <laughs> or for like his dirty mind. Like, yeah, you like, know, I just, like, yeah, I don't know. I'm... I think it's, uh, in the immortal words of John Stewart, I think it's hurting America. Mm. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. All right. For another conversation. Thank you, dude. Thank fucking you, man. Fucking appreciate it. That was great. That was really Thanks for coming over. Uh, yeah. Now we can geek out about motorcycles. Here we go. Out to the bikes. <laughs> Thank you so much for tuning in that conversation. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Uh, we got a couple things to help support that body of yours, one of which is the Align Band that people have been really loving, which I'm super grateful for. Um, it is a heavy-duty resistance band, comes along with a door anchor, traveling case, and then a online video guide on how to use that thing. It's my absolute go-to travel tool. I've got it hanging literally from my door right beside me now. Um, um, use it regularly, use it with clients. Uh, it can be found at alignpodcast.com slash gear uh, on Amazon. And you can also find it at Align Band on Instagram. Um, also, we finally did it. We created the Align Method online program, which focuses on unwinding the patterns of staring into technology, essentially. So forward head posture, rolled forward shoulders, rolled forward spine, kind of like just that hunchy posture thing that um, modern world is is stricken by uh, gets into how to align your physical body. So self-care, joint by joint, from ankle to knee to hip to spine to head to neck, etc. 
really good stuff. Also gets into lifestyle, um, gets into morning routines, nighttime routines, how to effectively handstand, how to move on the ground. Um, people have been loving that. Thank you all for grabbing it, the ones that have. And if people have any questions about that, you can reach out at Align Podcast on Instagram. I'm happy to support. All right. Thank you, guys. Enjoy your day. Thanks for joining you. Thanks for telling your friends. Thanks for reviews on iTunes. That's it. Pow.